Hey guys, welcome back to the biggest agricultural platform in Namibia known as Nduna Wemombe, which means Headman of Carol. My name, of course, is Mitchell Mutumba Simata, aka the Headman of Carol. So today, on this uh, Saturday, Saturday the 18th of uh, March, I want to talk about, somebody came and asked me a question. He said, I watched many of your videos on the red line, but tell me your personal opinion, why you want the red line gone? And I said then, I was like, ah, really the red line issue? I have spoken so much about the red line issue here on this platform. I think you guys are also tired of hearing about um, the veterinary corridor, uh, the red line. But let me talk about it a bit. Let's talk about it. There's, 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 um, what is this? Machine Gun Kelly once said in a diss song that he was trying to diss the goat Eminem. And I was like, let's talk about it. So... My personal opinion on the red line is this. I always say that I've had the luxury of farming on the commercial side, and I also have the luxury and experience on the communal side. And I do understand that. I understand why the red line is there. Let's start off at that point. I get why it's there. It is there to prevent disease outbreaks within the country. It is there as a measurement to try and prevent an outbreak of disease that probably happens in, let's say, um, Kavango from the Kavango, the Kavango region, that that animals that are probably sick, maybe the farmer or the people that are supposed to do the checks and balances didn't do the checks and balances properly. So there's pe those people move that uh, cows or goats or pigs, whatever it is, from Kavango and move them into Hortfontein area. And then suddenly you have, you go from one farm to probably a lot of farms and probably now the entire region having to be shut down. So I understand that uh, reasoning that they need that there as a controlling measurement to make sure that no animals that are sick animals or animal products or even food stuff that could be carrying certain illnesses are being brought this side, putting the entire country at risk. I get that. But I feel also that there could be better ways to do things. What do I mean by better ways to do things? Remember when um, C-19, COVID-19, um, hit the shores of Africa and hit, hit the world, hit the shores of every country on earth. People were panicking and going to the shop. Some were covering themselves with plastic bags and all type of things and going to the, to the sanitizer section, the dental section, the antiseptic, antiseptic uh, liquid section and buying it all out. Because they thought by buying all of these things out, they are going to be able to prevent themselves from getting COVID-19. But... They didn't realize that the best way to try and prevent COVID-19 is by wearing a face mask and making sure that when you're out in public and in crowded places, you wear your face mask as to prevent yourself from picking up all type of um, viral ail ailments that are out there. So once the doctors and the scientists and the um, people within the medical profession, in the medical fraternity, sat down and started telling us like, yes, you need to sanitize. But going and buying like 100 bottles of hand sanitizer is not going to cure COVID-19. You need to be able to sanitize. You need to be able to uh, wear your face mask when you're out in public. You need to minimize the touching of, of, play, of, 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 um, of things in public, holding rails and so forth, to the point whereby companies, even restaurants now, even till today, when you go to them, before you sit down, they first clean the table with some... Um, some um, cleaning liquid, which is very strong. Back in the day, they would just dry wipe the table, but now they, some even go as far as getting wet wipes and then wipe the, the desktop, I mean, wipe the table before anything, and some even do deep cleaning. So when those started, things started coming, I mean, started being told to the public, to us, that everyday people, we started having a better understanding of this illness and how we can live and actually survive with COVID-19 and be able to live a normal life. Because there was a time where people were panicking. You couldn't, people were even scared to go out to the shops. People were even scared to, to just stand outside because you're scared you're going to get it. And some people lived inside and were trapped in our houses, in our apartments, in our studio flat, uh, bedrooms, backroom yards. We watched up all the Netflix movies. We finished up our movie collections. We finished up our game, our, um, our games. We buy our game, uh, our game discs for our consoles. I finished up all my... Um, games, all my difficult games, uh, Call of Call of War, uh, is it Call of War? Yeah, Call of War, um, World War Two, uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. I finished that. 
I completed half of my games. Even FIFA, the soccer game, started becoming boring because I've won almost every trophy. So then you also had situations where depression started setting in because now you can't go out and see people. Sometimes you try to call them, people aren't answering you, watching the news. 100 people are dying, 200 people are dying, 1,000 people have been admitted, so many people are on uh, ventilators. It really became a situation whereby it was a very depressive, stuff, very depressive time and people who didn't live or live of depression were experiencing, started experiencing depression and those that have depression were probably having the worst time of their lives. So when we started getting the education, we started understanding how to mitigate against getting COVID-19 keeping yourself and your family and friends safe. And I think that is my policy when it comes to the red line and uh, the various diseases that you find up in the northern part of the country. The first thing I believe is better education of the people. I still think many of our people do not understand certain illnesses. I am on a group with farmers from Zambezi, where some of the farmers, even one man once said that when his cows have certain illnesses, he gives them roots and leaves. I don't know how clinically proven that rem uh, traditional remedy has been proved, uh, proven to say that it, dis it uh, minimizes this illness, it prevents this illness. I don't know. But many people still have that mindset. Many people still do not know certain illnesses. I am on a group every day, and you'd think a region like Zambezi region, where diseases like, let's say, um, lumpy skin disease, LSD, would be a common thing to many of them because they have to know it. it. I think it breaks out almost every year, every every after the rainy season, slumpy skin happens. You would think that many of them would know what this illness looks like and how it's supposed to look like, but they don't. Some of them probably say it's pimples or it's it's it's, it's growths on the cow's skin. They don't know what it is, and so they don't know how to uh, treat it. They don't know how to buy the right medication to start dosing and treating the animals. And then you get situations where some don't even know the scurvy the scurvy mouth illness that goats get, but you're in a region where this illness breaks out almost every year due to the type of condition and so forth. So that's where I've sat down and said, nah, man, there needs to be better education on the illnesses that are very common in the northern communal areas, particularly because the northern communal areas, you have the central northern part, you have the northeastern, you have, you have the northwestern, eastern, you have the northwestern, which is the Kunene, and then you have the northeastern, which is now Kavango in the Zambezi region. People need to be better educated on the type of illnesses that exist in those regions. Once farmers know that in the region that I live in, when it's rainy season, lumpy skin and probably other illnesses break out, this and this and this and this are the type of medication that I should buy to maintain, to maintain and inoculate my animals, to maintain and inoculate my animals and help, and help them keep, keep them safe from contracting certain illnesses. But when people do not know, when people do not know, illnesses will continue happening because I don't know. If I don't know what it is, if I'm seeing my neighbor busy injecting his animals and my neighbor doesn't share that information to say, no, man, I'm, 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 I'm using this, uh, for example, this bottle of medication, it's to prevent lumpy skin disease. If my neighbor doesn't share that information with me, I will not know that I need to be injecting for lumpy skin. And then the illness like lumpy skin happens, animals lose their appetite, animals start dying left, right and center. And we don't know. It suddenly goes from one crawl to over 100 crawls. And that's how easily the illnesses are spread within certain villages. Because some villages are literally in close proximity. Or if, if we're not in close proximity, our animals aren't keep, kept in uh, grazing camps. They are literally just let out by a herder who takes them by a herder. Or back in the day, they would say American ranchers. You, you watch the cowboy movies where the cowboys would get on their horse and take the cows out to the peri, to the peri or the pastures, as they would say, to go graze. We say uh, to the felt in Afrikaans or to the grazing areas. You take the animals out to go graze and you leave them. They graze there. There would sometimes be a natural lake, a natural drinking water body there. They would graze from the grass and then go drink that a natural water body. And that's how the diseases would start spreading amongst the animals because of their close proximity to each other. Now you're getting animals that are probably vaccinated for an illness and animals that are probably not vaccinated for an illness coming into close contact with each other and spreading whatever illnesses they can spread amongst each other. So I feel once this education starts happening, once this information is, starts being given out and, and our people, the northern communal farmers or people in the Zambezi region, the Zambezi region farmers, start being educated and start knowing that rainy season, this illness. Summer, I mean, rainy season, this illness. Dry season, this illness. Winter, this illness. Summer, this illness. 
These are the things that I must be paying attention to. And they start realizing that we need to be inoculating our animals, not just once. Because I know some farmers just inoculate once and then they it's done. You know, it's like saying I've inoculated my cows, I've inoculated my goats, I'm happy. It's done. They don't realize that they still need to continue doing the various um, inoculations. Because when I was farming commercial in Vertflay, you would literally start January, beginning of the year, all the way through to December, inoculating animals for various illnesses. Um, anthrax, um, sometimes you'd inject for lumpy skin, sometimes you'd inject, for, um, you'd inject uh, for rabies, and you'd inject all these different illnesses to prevent certain illnesses from breaking out. Even if your farm didn't have a, a tick infestation, but you know it's tick infestation season, and this is the time the cattle are going to be getting anaplasmosis and tick, um, tick heart water and whatnot, and all this illnesses the animals get from, from ticks, you would know that you just need to do this vaccination. What I've also noticed within some of the communal areas is they have a mindset or within the villages. Because sometimes, I understand, sometimes money is not available to buy medication. That's the sad reality. Sometimes they're not able to be able to buy these medications themselves. They sometimes have to rely on um, the state department, the, the, the Department of Veterinary Services within the Ministry of Agriculture to come and supply them for this medication. So because of that, they are unable to inoculate. But some of them have a mindset of, I'm going to first wait till something happens, then I'm going to do something. But it's like, for example, you know it's fire season. You know your area is probably fire prone. Rather than saying, let me take the precautionary steps to prevent a fire from breaking out on my farm. I'm first going to wait for the fire first to start burning. Then I want to do something, which is wrong. So that is what I've sat down and said that, look, I get why the red line is there. But we need to educate our people. Once the farmer on the ground is educated and knows every illnesses and the illnesses are translated into every indigenous language so the people understand and know from this uh, time of the year to this time of the year, this is what I need to pay attention to and this is what I need to vaccinate for. It would mean that we would limit outbreaks. I do, I do applaud um, the veterinary department within the Ministry of Agriculture. They try their hardest, but sometimes they undermanned. Sometimes maybe not enough cars. Sometimes it's things like not enough cars or not enough um, men and women, enough, enough bodies to deploy out. It's probably one or two vets for a big region, and it's problematic. This is why I'm saying that we must then educate, empower, inform, educate, empower, and inform our, farm, our farmers to be able to do these inoculations themselves, to be able to identify the illness themselves, and be able to take the precautionary steps to prevent this illness from breaking out. Once we do that, then we are going somewhere. Because the biggest concern for the red line has always been the movement of animals and also preventing the movement of animals and limiting the outbreaks of disease. Once we can reach to a point whereby the communal land farmers, small stock, large stock, chickens, goats, whatever it is they're farming, are able to identify illnesses and are able to inoculate and prevent these illnesses from spreading, that we move away from a point whereby now we're hearing Zambezi region, there's an outbreak of things where outbreaks of diseases are something of the past, or they will still happen, but they're not anymore as bad as they were back in the day, or they're not the, the, the duration of the illness doesn't last as long as it used to back in the day. Because I know sometimes when certain illnesses would break out in some of the regions, the rural, rural Namibia, the villages, some of these illnesses could at least could be burning through the region for a good two to three or even four months before they even bring it to control. So I'm saying let's empower the farmers so we can be able to get to the conversation where we can start talking about the removal of the red line and improving animal health. Because the biggest concern that I've spoken to private meat arbitral companies and private business people, they all say our concern is the health status of the animals. Certain countries, certain countries like, for example, the United States, don't allow for exporting of meat, of cattle, beef or goat or sheep that is exposed to certain illnesses. Some countries have strict uh, policies to say we don't allow, we don't consume meat of animals that receive certain inoculations and so forth. So those are some of the problems that we look at. So this is what has also led me that rather than just sitting here on YouTube and, and just talking too much, as some of the guys say, waba waba a lot, what am I doing? I am trying to set up a farmer's day in next month in April, April, 12, 13, 14, somewhere there, where we are setting up a farmer's day, where I want to, I've already spoken to the state vet of uh, the Zambezi region. It's going to be in Katima. We're going to start off in Katima first, before we move out to the other regions, where I've spoken to the state vet in Zambezi region. 
and uh, she has agreed. We have spoken to a cattle farmer um, who was coming from outside the region, but I'll try to get one of the experienced cattle farmers from inside the region who can come and teach. We are, who can come and teach the farmers what they should look out for and what they should do. So I believe for hosting the Nduna Wengombe, one of the first Nduna Wengombe Farmers Day um, talks, it could actually help get information out there to the farmers who are in the communal area, particularly the Zambezi. So farmers who are in Kavango, hey man, travel down. Let's let's make it a big, a big, a big situation. You know, that could be the first la launching pad for it. And then from there, we go into the other regions and maybe we go nationwide very soon. But it's all about just making sure that we educate our people. Because what I'm starting to realize is that um, in the communal areas, particularly where I'm from, my home region, the Zambezi, people do not know, people are ignorant. And when people are ignorant, uh, there's a word, there's a saying that goes, ignorant people are dangerous people. Because of their ignorance, they can become very dangerous by making statements or making decisions that are not well educated or well informed. So this is what led, led me to sit down and say, we need, I, myself and the people that are helping me, my YouTube channel needs to go to Zambezi and needs to go host the Farmer's Day. And we need to educate people. And we need to invite various experts in the field of agriculture, particularly in the animal. We're first going to focus on animals in the, in the field of animal husbandry to come and educate. Because I feel like people are not well informed. People are not educated on certain topics. And this is why many of the people need to make the decisions and make the mistakes they do in that region. So... That is what I'm looking at, and that is something that I want to bring, God willing, God willing, it's going to happen in April, because it's, it was supposed to be happen in January, but we've always been, I've always been moving it because something would come up. But hopefully we'll, we'll finally conclude um, the venue and everything uh, back home then in, in Zambezi so we can have it. And tickets will be going up for sale, tickets will be going up for sale very soon. You can book early, you can book now early bird tickets, or you can go book at the venue itself. Because that's what I want to do. I want us to come together as the farming community of Zambezi and see how we can improve the farming community, the, the livestock farming environment for Zambezi. So the farmers get better prices, better access to market, uh, less of this negative, um, negative um, information that's out there when it comes to the northern communal, particularly the Zambezi region, the information that's out there. So I want to improve it and I help them. I'm saying... Like uh, when Sir Ramaphosa came in as president, he was saying Tumamina. Tumamina, my mother tongue, we say Tumeme, which means send me. Send me, let me go and see what I can do for my people. I know many people are telling me, hey, why is Zambezi, you know how our people are, our people don't like supporting things. But I believe the farmers in Zambezi region are going to come out in numbers. And also farmers from maybe our neighboring regions like Kavango or even from... Yeah, from other parts are probably going to come through and we're going to have a hell of a Farmer's Day where we'll be doing some education and informing and just informing and educating our people on what is the new thing they need to pay attention to, how can we stop diseases, how can we improve our farming. Because I always say this, I cannot take Namibia as one farming unit. Every region, method of farming is unique to that region. Every region has different needs. So I'm hoping April 13th, that weekend of April the 10, going to April 14, that weekend, that week, Farmers Day will be up and going. We'll be, we'll be having it live in the Zambezi region. And the sponsors that I've reached out to will respond and tell me they're on board so we can get this thing going. So with that said, ladies and gentlemen, that is my opinion on um, the red line. Do I believe it should go? Yes. But I believe that it should be done with informed and scientific-backed uh, information so we do not destroy the meat industry. But... We actually create a meat industry that's inclusive for everybody. With that said, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to say bye for now.